All right. So our plane is up in the air. Our squadron's ready to go. Uh, zone one is a special kind of zone. All you really do is roll for the weather and take off. And then on the, on the flight back, all you do is roll for the weather and land. The rest of the zones, however, are much more involved. And the next step is to move on to zone number two. Now, here's where we really get into the meat and potatoes of the game. Uh, and in the, the table book, uh, the game tables book, it's right here, rule four, page five, weather in the zone. Here is where your turn really starts. There are some die roll modifiers that you do need to take into account. If in zone two on outward leg of the mission and the weather over the base was poor, there's a plus one modifier. So we have a plus one modifier. We'll go ahead and roll. That's two plus one is three. You'll see on the chart, three to five is haze. Now I'm going to go ahead and mark that on the chart that we are in haze. Haze is kind of the, the default position, if you will, uh, for weather. There are no die roll modifiers one way or the other. Uh, now, as we go through this first zone, zone number two, I'm also going to show you the zone worksheet and how it's filled out. You'll see I've put zone number two. The next thing it's asking for is a zone die roll modifier. You remember those numbers we looked at in the target book a few minutes ago? Uh, the target listings in Gazetteer. Again, here's our target for Lily. These are the numbers it's looking for here, the die roll modifiers. Minus 2 slash W in our case. And so I'll go ahead and mark that down. We'll get rid of the dice first. Minus 2 slash W. The first number, or it could be a letter, is an indication of how likely it is that you're going or how it, it, it modifies the fighter resistance you're going to face. The lower the number, the better it is for you. The less likely you're going to have heavy or uh, significant resistance. The number after the slash or the, the letter after the slash stands for where you are in your flight. In this case, W stands for water. We are over water in zone two, and that matters. Other letters uh, will be E for England, F for France, B for Belgium, G for Germany, and so on. But it's important that you know where you are because if the situation comes up where you need to bail out or you're forced to crash land or land somewhere other than your airbase, there are differing uh, uh, consequences for where you are when that happens. And so it's important to know what that is. The next box is Fighter Escort Level, and that's back here in the, ta uh, the Tables book. Now, it's in the pre-flight area of the Tables book, but the note suggests that you actually should roll on this table as you enter the zones. Now, on this table, you need to make sure you're in the right campaign area. And then you need to know which zone grouping you're in. And you only roll once per grouping. So for campaign number one, our groups are two to five, zones two through five or six through 15. You roll once when you enter zone two, and you don't roll again until you hit zone 16. Now in our case, we're only going to zone four, so we're only going to roll once on this table, and it'll be that way for the rest of the game. If we were going to zone 8 or 10 or 15, we would roll at zone 2 like we're about to. Then when we hit zone 6, we would roll. Then on the return mission, we'd roll again when we hit zone 5. But we're only going to roll the one time just because of the uh, idiosyncrasies of the mission we're flying. This is an indication of how good your fighter escort is. The good guys, if, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, there are no modifiers. You go ahead and roll. Comes up as a 9. If you look in our chart book, zones 2 through 5 in campaign 1, 9 is good. And that's exactly what it is. It's good. It's good that we're, and we're going to have good fighter resistance. And so I note that on the table because it will come in handy in a few minutes. Uh, we've already rolled for the weather. And then uh, before we get to the next area, which is contrails, if you look back at the book, 
after rolling for weather, the very next page has some charts on it that need explaining. First is weather over Alps. Now, if you're flying for the 15th Air Force out of uh, Italy, there are some targets that may require you to fly over the Alps, the mountain range in Central Europe. If you are flying out of Italy, and if the target book says, hey, this zone is over the Alps, you would roll on this chart instead of the one we just did. The next chart is mission recall. It is possible for your mission to be scrubbed, for your mission to be wiped out uh, due to weather. If the weather you rolled on the previous zone was 100% cloudy, you would then roll on this chart, and only then do you roll on this chart. And you would have a 6% chance, a 1 through 6 out of 100, for the mission to be recalled. We didn't roll 100% cloudy, so we don't have to roll on that this zone. Next zone may be different. However, the next chart is mechanical failure. This is a chart we do have to roll on. And you have to roll on this chart every single uh, zone you're in. It's a very small chance, but it does happen. So I roll. I always use the darker or black die as the tens. That's a 33. On our chart, that's no mechanical failure. So that's good. We do now, however, get to the next area on the zone worksheet, which is contrails. Contrails, as I'm sure you all know, are those white uh, uh, lines of cloud or steam or water vapor or whatever they are that appear behind an airplane if certain conditions are met. Contrails are bad in this game if you're the bomber pilot. It's basically a road map for fighters to come directly to find you. And you don't want that. You want to get to the target and back without ever seeing a German fighter if that's at all possible. So contrails are modeled in this game. It's the very next chart after the mechanical failure up here on contrails. It's a small but real chance that you're going to roll for contrails at some point during your mission. It's a 30% chance. I'm going to go ahead and roll. I get a 6. That's no contrails. And so I'm going to mark no on this table. All of this information will come into play once it comes time for us to actually look at uh, being attacked by German fighters. The next two boxes on this chart are formation and below 10,000 feet. Now, there are no charts for that. It's something that you either are or you aren't, and you are unless an event tells you that you aren't, so to speak. So we are in formation. An event may push us out of formation or it may temporarily disrupt our information or our formation. And so at that point, we would have to say out of formation or disrupted, and that carries with it a penalty. The next box is below 10,000 feet, yes or no. And the answer is basically going to be no unless an event makes you drop below 10,000 feet. Uh, B-17 bombers were not pressurized like modern planes of today are. You couldn't fly above 10,000 feet without supplemental oxygen for the crew to breathe. The air is too thin. There are, and so there was supplemental oxygen on these B-17s that these bombers used. There are damage events that can knock that oxygen out so that a crew member no longer has a source of oxygen. If that's the case, you as the pilot need to drop your bomber below 10,000 feet so that crew member doesn't die. Uh, and that's exactly what would happen if he didn't. He'd suffocate. He doesn't have any, any uh, air to breathe. And so it's important to note that as well. And again, there are also other factors if you're below 10,000 feet uh, that can modify future die rolls for other things. All right, so that brings us to the next table. It says gaff resistance level. And what that is, and it's the very next table in our book, is German fighter resistance or German Air Force resistance. Here is where the meat of the game really starts to happen, is on this table right here. You roll to figure out whether your German fighter resistance is anything from none to token to light to moderate to heavy. Uh, the fighter resistance is going to indicate how many fighters and how many waves of fighters you might see. 
Now, when you go to roll on this table, you're going to notice there's a long list of dice roll modifiers here. And so I'm going to go through each of those here, at least the ones that apply here real quick the first time. The plus minus number, that's that minus two we looked at earlier, remember, from the target book. So we've got minus two. We've got some for different kinds of weather, cloud cover or not, and we don't have any, so it's still minus two. Our fighter escort level. Well, remember, our fighter escort is good, so that's another minus one. So we're at minus three. Contrails, that's a plus. Uh, some of the formation areas are also pluses and, and other fighter escort levels. So we are at actually minus three. A minus two because of the zone and another minus one because of the fighter escort level. And so we'll roll on this table. We get a zero that's actually ten on a ten-sided die. Minus three is seven. And we look here, seven, campaign one, heavy. We have encountered heavy fighter resistance. And so I'm going to go ahead and mark that down here on the chart. Heavy fighter resistance. And where that comes into play are the next two charts that we might roll on. The first chart, the very next thing to do, is the number of German fighter waves. Now this is not the number of fighters. This is the number of waves of fighters. And they can go anywhere from zero to three. Again, there's a list of dice roll modifiers, mainly based on formation of the fighters and the fighter resistance. And you'll look here, you'll see German fighter resistance is heavy, is plus two. Bomber is in low position, low cell, which we are, that's another plus one. So we've got a die roll modifier here of plus three. That means it's likely not only are we to run into fighters, but likely to run into a lot of them. So let's go ahead and roll. We roll a two, but we have a plus three modifier. Now if you look, a, no, a roll of two would be zero waves. We'd avoid the fighters entirely. But we have our modifiers, which gives us five. We will have one wave of fighters in zone two. And so that's the next piece of information I'm going to mark on my sheet. One wave of fighters. The next thing that you'll do is on the very next page, German fighter appearance. Here is where you'll find out the exact number of fighters coming against you. It's a big long chart. There are no modifiers for it, but there's a lot of pieces of information. You'll roll two dice, two d6s, and it's just a regular total up the numbers. Or Actually, I'm sorry, it's not. It's like the d10s we've been rolling. One will be the 10s, one will be the ones. And again, I'll use the darker, the blue one, to be the tens. So we've got a 23. We look on our book. We find 23. And then we look at, at the tops of the columns are the fighter resistance levels. We're in heavy resistance. So you cross-reference 23, fighter resistance, heavy resistance, three FW-190s. So we have three FW-190s in this wave. Now I'm going to move our zone worksheet out of the way because we're going to use the rest of this board. Uh, let me grab the 190 playing pieces here. Each of the different kinds of planes has their own marker. This is the F, uh, FW-190 marker. If you again look at our chart, not only does it tell us we have three FW-190s, it tells us what direction they're coming in from. The first one is coming in from 12 o'clock high, and that's the 12 o'clock high position here in the game. The next one is coming in from 3 o'clock level, over to the right, and the next one is coming in at 1030 low, which is up here in the corner. If you're not familiar with the terminology for clock uh, targeting, it's just think of this as a clock. 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and so on. And that's how uh, aircraft identify what direction a, a potential uh, adversary is coming in from. So we've got three at 12 o'clock high, 3 o'clock level, 10.30 low. And just to show you the difference that the resistance level makes, if we'd have been at light resistance, that same dice roll, we'd have been up against one ME110. Instead, we're up against three FW190s. And I'm just going to make a note of those three on my zone worksheet. Let's see, that's three 190s, 12 o'clock high, 
3 o'clock level and 10.30 low. All right, the next step, once you've determined what fighters are attacking, is your fighter cover. How do they do against the fighters coming in to attack you? And that's this table here. The number of fighters driven off by friendly fighter escort. It's just a regular 2D6, and then depending on your fighter cover. Again, our fighter cover is good, so this may be a good thing for us. We may drive some of these guys off. Our dice roll is 8. If we cross-reference the chart, 8 is 1, 0. Now what the difference in those numbers are is that the first number, in this case 1, is how many fighters in the first wave of attacking fighters are driven off. Since this is the first wave, we will get to drive off one of these uh, fighters, and we get to decide which one that is. The number in parentheses is the numbers that, of fighters that are driven off if you have any other waves. And again, you can have up to three. Any other waves of fighters coming in, that second number is how many. In this case, it would be zero, but since it's only the one wave anyway, it really doesn't matter. Now, which one are we going to get rid of? Well, uh, I've read a little bit about German fighter tactics, and they always said the best way to attack a B-17 was to come in from head-on. It gave them the best odds of, of uh, hitting and the best odds of not being hit. It's the fewest uh, guns pointing in that direction. So I'm actually going to get rid of the 12 o'clock high fighter and take him off the board. So we don't have to worry about him. All we have to worry about is 3 o'clock level and 10.30 low. All right. Now, the next step, once your, once your fighter cover has done their things, is to determine which one of your guns fires at which fighter. Now, there's two different ways you can do that. Uh, and I'll show you the crew placement sheet here, and we talked a little bit about it. Okay, again, if you look at the crew placement sheet, for each of the gun positions, it gives you a list of what clock positions they can fire at. Okay, so if that makes the most sense to you, feel more than free to use your crew placement card to determine which guns fire at which fighters. However, I like to use the other method, and that's again in the table book. It's right below your uh, uh, fighter cover table. Defensive fire allocation. And it's got every clock level and which guns fire from that clock level. To me, it just makes it a little easier to make sure I'm not missing any guns if I just go to the clock level, say 3 o'clock level, and it'll tell me right here, 3 o'clock level, these are all the different uh, guns on my bomber that can fire at this bomber. And so I'm going to go ahead and mark that, and we'll start with a 3 o'clock level. The 3 o'clock level can be hit by the top turret, the ball turret, or the right waist gunner. Now each one of your gun positions has their own marker. Some people like to store them on the crew placement sheet. I like to store them off to the side. It makes it just a little bit easier for me. But I'll go ahead and place these on the board next to the plane they're going to be firing at. Again, that's the top turret, the ball turret, and the right waist gunner can all fire at that fighter coming in from 3 o'clock level. Checking the chart for 10.30 high, or I'm sorry, 10.30 low, I've got ball turret, left waist, and that's it. That's for, for a B-17F, only the ball turret and the left waist gunner. Now, the ball turret can fire at either one of these guys. So I'm actually going to move the ball turret gunner from the gun on the right, or the plane on the right at 3 o'clock level, and put him at 10.30 low. That way I have two, fi uh, two uh, guns firing at each uh, fighter coming in. Okay? Uh, next step is to determine the quality of the pilot that you're facing. Each individual pilot will have a rating. Now... The rating, I'll show you the, the chart here, is green, average, and ace, and there's an equal chance for each one of them. Again, there's been a lot of discussion about this online. 
some people get a little uh, upset that that's not historically th that the number of aces and the number of green pilots and the number of average pilots weren't uh, even dealt like that. I don't look at this as actual fighter aces, someone who's had five kills in combat, or a green pilot, a brand new pilot. I look at this more as fighter skill level, and that and actually is what the chart says, pilot skill level. A green pilot is a bad pilot. Could have just said good, bad, and average, uh, and that might have avoided all the, all the issues. A green pilot, to me, is a pilot who's not very good, an ace pilot is a pilot who's excellent. Now, uh, you could have a brand new pilot who's excellent and so could be an ace. You could have a brand new pilot who is green, uh, or a, a pilot who's been around forever and is green. So it really uh, kind of evens out better that way.